After completing the prestigious Jerome Fisher Program in Management and Technology from the University of Pennsylvania, Nalin Muni spent four years on Wall Street working at Goldman Sachs. He then returned to India and co-founded Forefront Capital, a pioneering alternative investment fund. Forefront Capital was subsequently acquired by Edelweiss, where Nalin and his wife and co-founder Radhika Gupta continued to work close to a decade after the acquisition. I sat down with Nalin to discuss the confluence of technology and finance, challenges he faced building one of India's first hedge funds, and how he uses shorts and special situations to boost his fund's performance. Sensei Kujaku. Hi, Nalin. Thanks so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Great to be on with you, Krish. Uh, awesome to, to do this. Thank you. Um, Nalin, so I want to start with um, the start of your professional career. You've had an interesting journey. I want to start actually with your degree at the University of Pennsylvania. Could you talk about your experience studying both engineering and business simultaneously? That was a great experience, uh, Krish. So I studied computer science on the engineering side and finance and statistics on the on the business side. Uh, so I was always fairly numerically and quantitatively inclined. Uh, and the reason it was interesting is because, uh, you know, when you study engineering and business together, you are being challenged on both your left brain and your right brain. And you're constantly being forced to connect the dots between two different fields. Uh, but for me, I thought that was the best thing uh, since sliced bread. And if I had to go back and do it again, I would do it in a heartbeat. And so let's talk about what you did first steps after college. You were working at Goldman Sachs. But did you ever consider working in Silicon Valley or technology over finance? Or was your heart always set on Wall Street and financials? So when I was looking for a job in my senior year, Krish, uh, I wanted to do something that combined these three fields, computer science, finance and statistics. Uh, I did consider jobs at Google, at Microsoft and other Silicon Valley firms. Uh, but I finally decided to go to Wall Street because I thought it was the best, it afforded me the best connection between these three subjects. And so, so let's talk a little more about what you actually did at Goldman. What, what fund exactly were you a part of and, and what was the strategy employed at that fund? Right. So I worked in the asset management division of Goldman Sachs, uh, where we managed money for pension funds, endowments, high net worth individuals, retail investors, etc. And uh, all of our funds were quantitatively driven, which means we built computer models to identify factors that predicted stock prices or bond prices or currency prices or commodity prices. Uh, and that involved some amount of finance, a lot of statistics and some amount of programming. So a great combination of the three things that I studied and the team at Goldman applied these computer models to all asset classes and all countries through a fund called the Global Alpha Fund. Okay. And so you were obviously involved in the three different segments that you spoke of. Can you talk about how you employed your computer science or engineering skills more generally in the finance field and what in terms of coding, what exactly were you looking for when you were building your algorithm or anything else that you employed? So. Uh, we think of ourselves as economists first. So, you know, when a good investor or any fund manager looks at a company, uh, they're looking for, let's say, a strong balance sheet. They're looking for strong cash flows. They're looking for strong growth, they're looking for cheap valuations. Uh, and there are ratios that define all of these. So a strong balance sheet may be measured by a low to no debt to equity. Uh, low valuation may be defined as a low P or a low PB ratio. Uh, strong growth could be defined as high sales growth and so on and so forth. Now, 
what a computer can help you to do is to apply that same heuristic, that same formula, not just on one company, but on hundreds and thousands of companies at the same time. And not only at one point in time, but across history. So that is where programming helps you to basically automate what would otherwise be a fairly menial and mundane task. Right. Got it. And so you were there for four years, like I said, and I, from what I understand, things were going great until they weren't. And things sort of fell off a cliff in the form of the global financial crisis. So what was it like being right at the heart of everything, working on Wall Street when the whole world seemed to be imploding? So Krish, uh, you know, I can tell you that at the time it was fairly stressful because you didn't know uh, which firm would fail next. We had Bear Stearns collapse, we had Merrill Lynch collapse, we had Lehman Brothers collapse and in 2007 and 8, these were household names and these were the stalwarts of global finance that had been around for hundreds of years. Uh, so it was stressful living through that in the moment, but I actually reflect back on it as being one of the best periods in my career because it taught me a lot about risk management, what not to do in the good times. It taught me a lot about empathy because we had to live through layoffs as well. Uh, it taught me a lot about how to manage clients. When times are tough, they tell you to get out in front of people and take it on the chin. So I wouldn't trade the experience of 2007 and 8 for, for anything. And so after I think it was 2009 or around that time when you decided to move back to India, and you co-founded your own company with Radhika Gupta, who is your partner in every sense of the word. So what was that experience like starting from scratch, uh, building a business and, and what lessons from your time either at college or at Goldman, um, what lessons did you apply to your process of building your company in, in India? Uh, so Krish, I started it much to the horror of my middle class parents uh, because I had just survived all of the layoffs. Uh, at Goldman, I'd actually been promoted uh, just that December and you know I called my mom and dad one day and said hey I'm moving back to Bombay I don't have a green card there is no way to go back but this is a dream to be a first generation entrepreneur and start something on my own so we booked one way tickets to to India in May of 2009 and just hit the ground running. Uh, it was a very, very humbling experience because we had never worked in India before. We were only all of 24 or 25, uh, 25 uh, in 2009. And, uh, you know, it, uh, we went, you, we went, I went from having a fancy business card which said Goldman Sachs to a piece of paper which said Forefront Capital, which nobody had ever heard of. So it was a very, very humbling experience. But again, I look back with so much positivity because those were some of the best days of my career. We worked really hard. We built everything from scratch. I was everything from the CEO to the Chaiwala in the office. Uh, and what Goldman uh, taught me was to always put the interests of clients first, to do simple stuff, uh, to run a company with integrity and you know keeping in mind the spirit and uh, letter of the law and uh, we've really built forefront one investor and one investment at a time. Right, so uh, let's talk about that some actually. I, I can only imagine how difficult it is in that situation to build a business for the simple reason that how do you attract clients, right? So if there's a family office or an H&I, he or she would obviously already have tons of advisors and they could say, I can go to all the established mutual funds and all the other fund houses. How do you convince them to take that gambit on you and say that 
even if it's a very tiny portion of their overall portfolio how do you convince them to get on board with you when they have such a variety of options of largely established players right so we were really lucky krish and you know people starting businesses don't give enough credit to luck in the sense that we started in a year when markets were booming mm. uh if you remember 2009 was the year that upa2 came to power and on may 18th on the day of the election results the sensex opened up i think 18 to 19% and it sparked a huge rally in all sorts of stocks for the rest of the year i mean markets were up 70 to 80% that year and some of that initial luck about getting clients was also about riding that wave hmm. uh it wasn't our doing it's not that we saw this coming we were just lucky to be in the right place at the right time now the beauty of public markets is that you can start with a very small amount of money and then grow it over a period of time and that's what we have done and i say it's luck because if we had started 12 months earlier i wouldn't probably be sitting here talking to you we would have shut down and i would have gone back to america quite quickly well you i'm sure there's always an element of luck but you obviously doing something right because about i think 5 years into the business you the company got acquired by edelweiss so can you talk about that process that experience and and it wasn't an acquisition as much as it was an acqui hire because you and radhika were while they of course took the business itself you and radhika were clearly seen as valuable sort of assets to have within the larger edelweiss umbrella so talk to me about that experience of being acquired and your thought process behind joining hands with a larger established company right so krishwan i started the business in 2009 uh it was never in the plan to sell the business uh you know we said this is something that we really want to work on for the rest of our lives it's something that we are excited about and it's something that it has a very large size of opportunity so selling was never part of of the plan uh the five years of upa2 were very very hard for india and the stock market again if you remember you had scams like the 2g scam you had the commonwealth games scam uh you had coal deallocation and india was completely gridlocked with red tape and the economy was also gridlocked with red tape uh so it's difficult to generate returns in a period when uh markets themselves are not supportive uh we had built up to about 150 to 200 crores of AUM so we had built some amount of distribution we had a good client base uh we had a fairly decent track record krish and you know in 2013 uh we realized that to scale this business from 150 crores to 1500 crores or to even to 15000 crores would require a much larger investment than just investment acumen hmm. it would require sales people it would require compliance it would require marketing it would require uh you know operational staff and so we said let's sell the business but continue to run it in the current avatar because we were constrained coming from a middle class home and with all my and radhika's life savings in in the business so we said let's sell the business now again a very non traditional decision because many people from business families or first generation entrepreneurs love control and they would never sell it something that they built but we said look we took a fairly cold and calculated decision that it was the right call to sell the company so we had hdfc bank represent us as investment bankers we met many many suitors and we felt that edelweiss was the the best fit it didn't hurt that they were also the highest bidder 
right? Uh, one thing that helped us, Krish, that is advice that I give all entrepreneurs is that we ran the company squeaky clean. So we had no cash dealings. We had everything was above the table. We had no personal expenses on the company's books. Uh, the company's cash was managed very, very conservatively. Uh, we had paid all our taxes done all our filings. Uh, and these are the things that people often miss when they're building a business. But we were very particular about that along the way, even though we had no intention to sell, it helped us to close a sale quicker. Yeah. And so, so you were at 150 roughly when you got acquired. Yes. So, and what, what AUM do you manage today? So today, uh, in our alternatives business, uh, Krish, we're managing about two and a half thousand crores. Uh, and Radhika looks after the mutual fund business, which as of yesterday has touched one lakh crores. Oh, okay. So uh, it's been a great, uh, a great journey in that sense. Yeah. So, so let's actually now talk about the alternates business, which you look after. Um, what I want to start with the most basic question, actually, which is what is an AIF and, and how is it different from the more traditional products such as a mutual fund? So an AIF Krish is nothing but a vehicle. And what I mean by that is it's a fund where people pool money together. So you and I could be investors in the same AIF. We pool our money together and then the fund manager invests it for us. It's similar in that regard to a mutual fund. A mutual fund also does that. The only difference is that the AIF has a lot more freedom and flexibility to invest. So for example, uh, an AIF can, some kind, some AIFs can invest in unlisted startups. Some AIFs can take leverage. Some AIFs can do shorting. Some AIFs can invest in commodities. Uh, so there is a lot more freedom and flexibility given to, to fund managers to, to invest in an AIF. And that is part of the draw. Right. And so you, of course, within your business manage more than just one fund. Um, what are the different funds that you manage and what are the different strategies employed in each of those funds? All right. So we manage uh, four funds in total today, Krish. One is uh, a long short fund called Edelweiss Alternative Equity. We have a fund that does special situations called Catalyst. We have a consumer focused fund called Consumer Trends. And then we have a fund that focus on undiscovered mid and small cap companies called the Focused Mid and Small Cap Fund. Okay. So these are four funds in total. So let's actually talk about um, two of the strategies that you get to employ. And you have a luxury that a lot of fund managers don't have, which is that in addition to going long on businesses, you can actually short some companies or stocks and you can invest in special situations, as you mentioned. So I want to talk about these two strategies that you employ and sure. first on shorting. Could you tell me what is it that you are looking for when you short a company? So Krish, India has always been a stock pickers market to find and if it has been a stock pickers market to find good companies that are creating shareholder wealth, by definition, it must also be a stock pickers market to find bad companies that are destroying shareholder wealth. So in our short strategy, we are essentially looking for stocks that will fall in value. And the way we do that is by studying patterns of shareholder wealth destruction. So we're looking for highly leveraged companies, companies approaching bankruptcy. Uh, we're looking for companies that are going through some kind of tech disruption. We're looking for commodity companies or cyclicals at the top of the cycle. And that is our focus in the, in the short strategy. 
Right. So let's bifurcate shorts into two categories. So the first is where your analysis tells you there is some sort of fraudulent activity, let's call it. And the second is where you think that there is some core economic problem, either structural or cyclical. So if we talk about the first category, how easy or difficult is it to actually short a company if you detect some element of fraud? Because while your assessment, assuming it is correct, you only make money when the market itself recognizes and validates your assessment, which can take years as, I mean, there's many cases where companies were, you know, poster boys for growth and governance right until the point where the cockroaches come out of the kitchen. So how do you time your shorts in that category? So frauds actually are very difficult, uh, Krish, uh, you know, because even if you know that there is a certain corporate governance issue, uh, timing it exactly can be very, very difficult. And there can also be a very, very long period of pain before you are right. Uh, you know, a classic example is a current group that is in the news. Uh, whose stock prices have been meteorically, uh, who have risen meteorically over the last three to five years, but are currently under a lot of pressure. Uh, what is easier is to basically short companies that are highly leveraged, because there all it takes is a little bit of a slowdown in the business cycle or rising interest rates to really pop those bubbles. So we find shorting highly leveraged businesses to be much, much uh, easier to do than detecting frauds. And of course, we do look at a few frauds, uh, if only to avoid them uh, entirely. Okay. So, so yeah, it's a good segue into the second bucket that I want to discuss. Um, how do you gauge whether or not all the negatives, for example, a leverage balance sheet or poor cash flows or anything else, how do you know that that is not already baked into the price? Because, you know, if, if it's a bad, I mean, I use bad in inverted commas, a bad company or a bad business, that would in many ways reflect in the price itself. So how do you gauge whether all the negatives have been baked in or there is still room for the stock to fall? So I'll give you an example of a bank. Okay, Krish, uh, now imagine a bank has a 100 rupee loan book with 10 rupees of equity. So it's leveraged 10 is to 1. Now, all of a sudden, if a bank, if that same bank reports a 14% NPA rate, which means it has 14 rupees of bad loans, the entire book the entire equity of the bank is wiped out. Okay, so the bank is basically insolvent. Now, for a company that is insolvent, there is no price that is too low. Right? In that case, there is no, since there is no more book value, there is no price to book ratio that is too cheap. So you short it based, we short situations like this, which are fairly no brainer ideas. And so how, how often would such an idea come? Because while this may obviously be the theoretically ideal shorting opportunity, something like this obviously doesn't happen every day. So are your, is your short book, does it tend to have a low weight until such events occur? Or is there something that you do on a more regular basis that allows you to build a sufficiently large short book? So it is, uh, you know, shorts by their very nature are opportunistic. This kind of example in financial services happens a lot because banks and NBFCs by their very nature, you know, employ leverage and hence are really susceptible to periods of bad loans. So, uh, so you mentioned, let's call it the financials more broadly, but beyond that, are there any sectors or industries you think that are more prone to either fraudulent behavior or structural economic issues that lend themselves to shorting? 
So historically, we've also found a good amount of ideas in the infrastructure and real estate space. And the reason, Krish, is that those industries, by their very nature, are politically exposed. And promoters in those industries have large sets of cash dealings. So they are, by definition, easier short targets. Okay. And so let's now just take a second and talk about the other um, strategy that you can employ, which is special situations. Could you explain what you mean by special situations and what are the different opportunities within that sphere? So that's a very vast word, Krish, and it can mean many things to many people. But for us, it basically means a corporate event. So a corporate event could be a buyback, an open offer, a merger, a demerger, an IPO, QIP, rights issue, delisting, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, this category of events uh, is very, very interesting because it requires a, a multidisciplinary mind to take advantage of. You need to know law. You need to be a lawyer like you. Uh, you need to know corporate finance. You need to know the history of families and businesses. You need to know, uh, you need to be a good trader. You need to be very good at risk management. Uh, and you need to put all of that together to to identify and profit from these opportunities. So can you give me some examples? It can be events that have ended so you can, you know, if, if you can even mention a specific name or a spe specific example where one where things worked out as you anticipated and one where things didn't work out as you thought they would. Right. So uh, I'll give you an example from the, the long past. Uh, so in 2013, uh, Hindustan Unilever had an open offer, a voluntary open offer on their stock. Uh, and that was a no-brainer because India was struggling. Here was a blue chip MNC corporate, a nifty stock even in those days, that was saying, hey, I am willing to buy Unilever PLC, the, their, their parent was willing to buy up to 25% of the company from minority shareholders. So that was a, a no-brainer kind of situation because there was a group with really high corporate governance saying our stock is dirt cheap and it's so dirt cheap that we're willing to buy a quarter of the company from you at 600, 600 rupees, 606 including dividends. Uh, so that open offer came, Unilever was at about 520. We participated, we sold it to, to levers at 600, but probably shouldn't have because the stock has multiplied many fold since then. So that's a very simple example of a special situation. Right. And, and have there been cases where either regulatory issues have popped up or something else has come that has derailed that event and therefore things didn't work out? So that has, it has happened, Krish, uh, you know, but we've also tried to steer, steer clear of landmines. So for example, uh, hostile takeovers, uh, deals that require serious competition commission approval, uh, you know, conditional buybacks or open offers, you know, these are things that have a high degree of failure risk. Right. And so either in shorting or when you when you participate in these corporate events uh, or special situations, do you have a framework that you employ in terms of either stop losses or some sort of framework that makes you say, if this specific thing happens, then come what, we, come what may, we just exit? Yes, Chris. So 
that is actually paramount to being being successful in special situations so we are very strict about position sizing and also about having both price based and time based stop losses okay okay got it and we've spoken of course on <coughs> special situations and shorting i now want to come to what is actually the largest part of your um, entire strategy which is your core holdings on the long side could you talk about what sort of companies you're looking for on the long side and and just as importantly you've obviously talked about the sum in terms of the shorts but what are you avoiding when looking at companies uh, for the long side so for the long side we're doing very simple things krish uh, we hold a 20 stock portfolio of blue chip good quality businesses so we're looking for competitive advantage high roc and roe low debt to equity good corporate governance is a non negotiable and then moderate to reasonable valuations so so let's talk about valuation actually um there's a multitude of opinions on what valuations people should be willing to buy companies at and and there's some people who subscribe to the opinion that if a company is doing well and well in terms of what you said in terms of return metrics and leverage and so on that it's more than justified to play to pay very high valuations if you look at just basic pe multiples of 50 60 70 and there's the other end of the opinion spectrum which is you know you're crazy to spend that much so where do you where do you fall on that and how do you justify not only buying but holding companies at pe's of 50 60 70 assuming you actually do that so our preferred tool for valuation krish is the discounted cash flow method uh because a p ratio only takes into account one year of earnings uh either forward or trailing so we use a discounted cash flow analysis and to do a, a proper dcf takes time and an effort because you really have to think through the the business and its drivers very very carefully now when you run a dcf you can also you'll get a you'll get a price you'll also get a range of prices and from that you can infer what a fair p ratio should be i'm somewhere in the middle but should you be paying 100 times 150 times no and the last year has also taught us that you can't just pay blindly for even the bluest of blue chips Right. So now that I've got a good sense of your investing framework, I now actually want to take you back to your time in the US and working at Goldman. There's one particular firm that I want to talk to you about, which you know I I, I just want to use it as an example of the kind of firms that Indian companies should aspire to be, which is Citadel, which has been in the news recently for having the best ever year hedge fund has ever had, posting a sixteen billion dollar gain. I I want to get your sense based on your own experience as to what it will take for India to produce a Citadel or a company like that and what I mean by that is a company operating at tremendous scale globally and even at a 40 50 60 billion dollar AUM generating returns beyond companies that have you know a 20 million dollar AUM so Krish I think it's only a matter of time before it it happens. And we have the talent uh and you know it is India is becoming the you know the a hub for intellectual talent in so many industries. Why can't the same it could be a hub for investment management talent as well. So there is an, it's it's there is nothing that is currently holding us back from from doing something like that but is it ultimately a function of the size of the investing market in india and what i mean by that is that for for someone to build a citadel or equally large entity you need sufficiently large investors and what i mean by that is for example in the us you have large pension funds 
universities, endowments, all of that investing billions of dollars into such organizations, which is why you can, a company can grow to 30, 40, 50 billion. So until that entire ecosystem develops in India, do you think that something like a Citadel is possible in India? So the Indian version of Citadel may look very different. An Indian version of Citadel may be investing in unlisted assets in uh, both debt and equity uh, and may you know may not be as active a trader as Citadel is because our markets are not as liquid but there are enough examples of India dedicated funds that have very very sizable AUMs that have delivered excellent returns for investors right so Nalan I'm actually going to end again talking about your own journey and your career while you've obviously achieved a lot over the last 15 to 20 years that you've been working what is it that you still see as an ambition or a goal that you have that you want to accomplish so I want to take this two and a half thousand to twenty five thousand uh, I want to build a business that I can look back and say I'm proud of uh, do you know well for our investors deliver them good returns deliver them a good experience but also along the way maybe shape regulation and shape you know the way the government thinks about asset management and savings uh, for an Indian investor and I think the best days are still yet to come right and if you don't mind I can just ask one other question which actually is a little more personal, which is on the fitness side of things, you are an avid uh, marathon runner and now you even do Ironman. What are some of the lessons you've learned through that entire process? Um, and if any of those lessons are applicable to the investing world? So they often say investing is a marathon, uh, not a sprint. Uh, and only when you run a marathon do you really understand what that actually means because a marathon Krish is not about running 42 kilometers once it's about running one kilometer 42 times and that analogy is true of building a business of investing or of anything that you do you take one step at a time, you take one day at a time, you take one week at a time, one month at a time and just focus on the task at hand and do a good job on each task with the faith that it will all come together in, in due course. Nalin, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on, Krish. Thank you. We hope you found this video useful and engaging. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Thanks for watching.